got here. I'm going to see Sir Ken. He's so happy to be here. He's here yes. twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just missing. Who are we missing? Oh, David just joined us. That's great. Uh, we'll get going in just a moment. I guess we have we have most of everybody, so let's just get going. <clears throat> everybody can hear me okay? I'm sorry. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, thanks. New headset. Today. Everybody was complaining last week. Okay, so uh, today I thought what we would do is review a case from the lab in the recent past just to review uh, how we think about things. So this is a 10-year-old who uh, <clears throat> had a rat, complained of a rapid heartbeat, and this is a tracing that was obtained by the ambulance workers. Since there are no lines on this paper, because it's such a poor copy, I will tell you that the heart rate was 240 beats per minute. So um, Neha, what would you be thinking based on this? if you just saw this as the clinician? So definitely 240 is not sinus for a 10 year old and uh, it's a regular narrow complex tachycardia. Um, and based on, if I had to guess at this age, um, it, it would likely be, I mean, I guess it could be AVNRT or AVRT. Mm -hmm. um, the kid's 10 years, so um, I know in the younger infant age group, AVRT is more likely, and as you get older, AVNRT gets more likely. Um, mm -hmm. So statistically, you would say this is which which is more likely than at age ten? AVNRT. AVNRT. Uh, no. Statistically, AV ORT or AVRT would be more likely mm -hmm. uh, in a patient this age. Um, of course, it's only statistical. We don't really know. But generally speaking, yes, if somebody had tachycardia at 240, um, what about the rate? Does the rate in any fashion help you? Um, the rate, yeah, I think um, at 240, it's um, likely AVRT. AVNRT is slightly slow, like um, in the range of 180s, 200s. So. Right. so I think that's true that most of the time AVNRT is slower than uh, ORT, but in a young patient, it's hard to know for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you say anything based on this tracing in terms of uh, what you think this might be? Uh, I mean, right after the QRS, um, if that's the P wave, um, then... Are you referring to this area here or, are you, or here? What are you talking about? If like the one on the top after that. This here, you mean? Yeah, okay. probably not. If, okay. that is, if that is a retrograde, um, P wave, then um, it would be a long RP tachycardia, and um, that would suggest more towards AVRT. Right, uh -huh. that's true. Although that would be a very long RP, right? Well, right, so, yeah, so it's the, hard to tell basically, yeah. right? And it's very difficult on this tracing. I mean, maybe the there's a strange little inflection here at the bottom, but it's almost impossible to tell from this. Mm -hmm. So I think going in, it's fair to say statistically more likely ORT, certainly, however, could be still AVNRT. Um, so we'll have to see. <clears throat> okay, so we uh, take the patient to the cath lab and usual, as usual, 
the first thing that we do is we measure the uh, normal ECG intervals. And we see here that the uh, all the intervals or the EKG looks completely normal. I specifically recorded this at 25 speeds so that everybody could see uh, what it looks like on a normal EKG, even though normally, as you know, we run the paper at 100 or even 200 millimeters per second. Um, so I think you'd all agree this looks like a normal ECG, maybe some right atrial enlargement, but sometimes the uh, the uh, amplitude of signals is going to be a little unusual on a on a, uh, a Pruka recording system. Okay. So let's go through the channels. So as is usual, we almost always uh, display. Uh, a number of electrocardiographic channels on the top of the screen. In this particular lab, we we're displaying uh, lead one AVF, V1 and V6, which should give us a nice uh, uh, smorgasbord of evaluation of the surface electrocardiogram. Uh, normally we display the high right atrium. <laughs> In this particular case, we did not because the uh, I didn't I decided because the size of the patient was small that we didn't really need a, an additional catheter in the patient and so this channel is blank for this procedure and we can usually pace either through the ablation catheter which can be used on, until the time that we're ablating we can use it as a pacing catheter or alternatively we can pace from the coronary sinus because uh, as you see, there's very large atrial electrogram in the coronary sinus. So in this case, we have a hiss, a hiss with a distal, mid, and proximal. Here we have the uh, ablation. And then we have coronary sinus displayed from proximal to distal. Um, and again, always worth when you're looking at these types of tracings to look at the uh, side here for uh, which channel is which. And uh, finally, at the bottom, we have the right ventricular apical, uh, apical channel as well. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next stage. So here we are, we're measuring the uh, baseline intervals. So at the beginning of any EP study, we always wanna do that. And so the A to H interval is 48 milliseconds from the onset of the, P, the A until the onset of the uh, Hiss in the same channel. That's the traditional way in which you measure an AH interval. And then we also measure the HV interval, which is measured from the onset of the Hiss to the earliest V in any channel. And in this case, the HV interval is uh, 44 milliseconds. And so basically the uh, AH was 48, the HV was 44, and the cycle length is 830 milliseconds. And so that's an important, all these are important data because if we're gonna be doing an ablation, we sort of wanna know what you're starting with before you get going with burning and manipulating catheters inside the heart too aggressively. And these are normal values for a patient um, who uh, uh, has normal AV nodal conduction. So uh, every laboratory will do an EP study in a different order, but I always try to do it in the same order at least so that we don't forget to do anything. And so my usual approach is to first do rapid atrial pacing. And um, David, what do you think is the benefit of doing rapid atrial pacing in somebody at the beginning of an EP study? Why would we do that? You could see if there's a rate, how quickly the um, accessory pathway might be able to conduct. So that way, if heaven's forbid they go into AFib, um, they, if their accessory pathway could conduct that rapid atrial rate, that'll put them at high risk for uh, ventricular, like uh, VFib later on. Okay, that's true. But at this point, at least, right, we don't see any evidence for a accessory pathway, at least not a manifest one. In other words, there's no evidence for WPW here, right? Because there's no pre-excitation. Because remember that when someone is pre-excited, the H to V interval will be negative or at least less than normal. And an HV interval of 48 milliseconds is normal because we recall that a normal HV interval is between 35 and 50 milliseconds. And our patient had one, I think of a 40, what was it? Let's see here. 44 milliseconds. Um, so, <clears throat> a 
Okay, so yes, you're right. If the patient had WPW, you would certainly want to pace rapidly in order to determine at what point can the pathway stop conducting or what is the level of risk for the patient. That's a, considered a surrogate of assessing atrial fibrillation risk. But what other uh, benefit would there be in someone, even who doesn't have a manifest WPW pathway of rapid atrial pacing? So you would, I guess you'd be testing the characteristics of their AV node then, if they don't have an accessory pathway, and that's, to see at what point their AV node would wank about. That's exactly right. That's very important because remember what Neha said, which was that this patient either has ORT based on an accessory pathway or AVNRT. And uh, if the patient has either of those, it's possible that we'll be burning somewhere near the AV node. And so it's useful to know how good or bad the AV node is before you get going. Um, <clears throat> also, rapid atrial pacing sometimes can give us some hints as to what the cause is. So let me ask you, David, we may have said that this patient could have either AVNRT or uh, AVRT or ORT. <coughs> Has anything thus far told us whether which of those two this diagnosis is? I'm just trying to take a closer look at the um, each channel here. Um, I mean, we we mentioned that um, we're not um, if there's an accessory pathway um, outside of the AV node. Um, I suspect that our um, there should be a, a, a by our mapping channel we might be able to find an area at which there's a separation between the QRS on our regular ECG leads um, versus the QRS on our mapping electrodes where we can get a, a both an atrial and ventricular electrogram on the same electrode and I'm just looking to see if I can see that. So basically. Have we identified any evidence for an antegrade conducting pathway? In other words, is there evidence for WPW at this stage in this patient? I would say not. Um, I'm correct. not. That's right. There's no pre excitation. The AH, the HV intervals are normal. <clears throat> and when we look in the coronary sinus pairs, we see that the A and V are very separate. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have what we would sometimes refer to as concentric antegrade conduction, meaning that the V, normally we should go from the atrium to the ventricle through the AV node and Hiss-Purkinje system. So the ventricular electrogram in the Hiss should be the earliest of all the ventricular electrograms. And I think when we compare this to the, the electrograms in the coronary sinus, which reflect what's going on around the mitral annulus, I think it's fair to say that at the very least, they're not any earlier than the Hiss. So there is no obvious evidence for, for example, a left-sided pathway. We can't speak much to a right-sided, but if there were a right-sided pathway, presumably the HV interval would be short, but in fact is not. So, so we, we have almost ruled out the possibility of WPW or an antegrade conducting pathway, but we have not ruled out the possibility of a concealed or retrograde only conducting pathway. Does that make sense? So let's just keep going. Uh, so here we are, we're rapid atrial pacing at cycle length 650. And David, what is that heart rate, cycle length 650? How would you calculate that? So I believe you take um, 60,000 and divide that by uh, 650. Right, so that would be a rate of 92, okay? <clears throat> so here we are, we're pacing at at 650, and we are looking at normal AH and HV intervals. Now we're at uh, coming down and making the cycle length shorter and shorter. <clears throat> and uh, at cycle length 600, we see if we compare in our mind's eye the appearance at 600 to 650, it, perhaps the AV time is ever so slightly wider apart which would be consistent with the presence of a decrementally conducting AV node. Just for time's sake, we'll go by 50 millisecond increments. And uh, <clears throat> now we have gone to cycle length 550. And I think it would be fair to say that the AV time is getting wider 
And that is what we would expect because as we get faster and faster, the AV node should conduct uh, with slower and slower because the uh, because of uh, the decremental conduction characteristics of the his Purkinje system. Now we're at cycle length 500. And again, I think if you keep in mind how widely spaced the A and the V are here, we'll just go right quickly, go back to when we were at 600. I think it's fair, pretty easy to see that at 600, the AV time was a fair bit uh, tighter than say <clears throat> at 500. So now we're gonna go down to uh, cycle length 450 and we see that the uh, AV time is longer still. And here, here we see something interesting. On the left-hand panel, we're pacing at cycle length 450. And on the right-hand panel, Josie is pacing at cycle length 440. So uh, let me ask, uh, let me ask Grace Kong if she has any idea of what the difference is. Like, why is it changing from at 450? It appears as if there's a change. And can you tell me like what's different on these beats versus these beats? Mm -hmm. It looks like the decremental widening of the AV is more pronounced in between this two cycle length. Yeah, and um, it's quite a big, uh, for lack of a better term, jump, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. So this would be suggestive of the possibility that we jumped from a fast pathway to a slow pathway. So this is the first evidence in this procedure of something that could possibly hint towards what this patient has, but we really don't know. Okay. Now, okay, let me just keep moving on here. Here we are, we're pacing at cycle length 410, and I think we would all agree that the AV interval here is far wider than uh, it was in the beginning. I'll just quickly go back to, uh, right, this is like at 500. Look at this AV time versus now we're at uh, cycle length uh, 410 and look how wide it is. So clearly uh, the AV conduction is decrementing. So this is uh, again, further evidence that we are not, um, not dealing with an antigrade conducting accessory pathway. Because remember accessory pathways, WPW pathways do not decrement. They, they uh, conduct without decremental characteristics in general. Here we are now at cycle length 380. And now what's happening is, is that the PR interval from the pacing spike to the QRS is almost as long as the R to R interval. And here at cycle length 330, the PR interval is in fact as long as the R to R interval. And so this suggests that we are either approaching the Wenke box cycle length of the patient or that this could be evidence for conducting through um, the slow pathway, uh, meaning that we have both a fast and a slow pathway. Now, Uzo, does the presence of slow pathway conduction mean that the patient has AVNRT? No, Dr. Pass, it, it can be a normal, it, it suggests a substrate for, but it doesn't. Um... That is an outstanding answer, Chief Fellow Uzo. Obiaka, correct. Lots of healthy patients have, dub, have dual AV node physiology. So the presence of fast and slow conduction through the AV node is, is important information, but it does not by itself definitively say what the patient has. <clears throat> so here we are uh, rapid pacing at cycle length 320. And um, what happens here? Let me ask, uh, go back to Dr. Luwalia. She had such an easy question before as for a marginally more difficult one. What's happening here, Neha, when we, uh, on the left-hand panel, we're at 320 and on the right-hand, we're at 310. Um, 
So, I mean, the PRs are uh, very long, similar to what we've been seeing in the previous pages. And then, um, in the last three beats, um, I'm trying to see that, um, and it's not, um, I guess there is one P which did not conduct, but on the, no, I think it's, uh, is there a non-conductor beat in the end? Yes. The last is. one, yeah. So, so let's just go through this. So yeah. on the bottom on this, the way that it's displayed in our laboratory is it'll always tell you if we're pacing. So S1, pacing the atrium to the ventricle, atrium to ventricle, atrium to ventricle, atrium, and then look up here. There's no ventricle, right? There's no QRS. So, uh, and in fact, uh, what we're seeing here is uh, wanky buff, right? Because look at this. After this doesn't conduct, look at the PR interval here. That's because it's much shorter, right? This AV time is much shorter than these. That's because the AV node has not been conducting uh, over here. Um, and so it's uh, got, a, it got a break basically. So the, because the, the P to P interval basically from where the AV nodal to AV nodal um, conduction is uh, from here to here. And it, it's really basically the last time the AV node conducted was on this QRS, which is why this PR is shorter. So this is an example of a uh, wanky buff. Now, uh, the next thing that I normally do, so, so usually you go to Wanky Bach and uh, you denote that. And that's important because, again, we want to know. So now we have two major characteristics that we have established of this particular patient's AV node. First, we know that the AH and the HV intervals are 44 and 48 or 48 and 44, whatever we recorded. We know that the patient is Wanky Bocking at about cycle length 310. So uh, basically, those are both normal values. And so that's important because we're about to do some kind of an ablation, we think, we hope, and we want to know what we started with. Okay. Uh, okay. So the next step that I normally do, and again, one can do this in any direction or order one wants, is to do atrial extra stimulus testing. And in this case, we're going to do, uh, I just randomly chose cycle length 600. So what we're measuring is the A to H interval from, and in this case, it's this uh, inflection here, which is the atrial depolarization, and this is the Hiss. And we're gonna be looking, another way to look at it more simply is just the AV delay. And so we're going to, in atrial extra stimulus testing, we drop the S2, or the last beat after a pacing train of eight beats at cycle length 600, which is in this case, a rate of 100, we would put in an extra beat. And each time we put an extra beat in, we will decrement the extra stimulus by 10 milliseconds. But for the sake of time, I'm going to drop it by 50 milliseconds uh, until we see something interesting. So here we are at 600, 450, and the AH and HV all look pretty normal. And this is 600, 400. And we can see already that the AV delay is longer, right? This is pacing at cycling 600. And you can just see between the drivetrain at a rate of 100 and this extra stim, we see already that the AV delay is longer. And that would be consistent again with the presence of so-called um, decremental AV conduction. Now here, is uh, 600, 390, and we see the AH is, is getting at even farther. 600, 370, the AH is, is moving out farther, but generally speaking, we would consider someone to have dual AV node physiology. If there is a 50 millisecond jump for a 10 millisecond decrement in S2, and we never quite see that although the AH does get lo fairly long. 
Here we are at 600, 360. 300, 600, 350, getting longer. 600, 340, getting longer still. Again, this is a beautiful demonstration of decremental AD conduction. Here's 600, 310, very long AH interval. Here we are at 600, 300, even longer, but something different happened here. There's an extra signal. So let me, uh, let me go back to uh, Dr. Uzo. Do you see anything different here, Uzo? So um, looking at the left side of the screen, comparing it to the right side, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on my way, so there's a lot of background noise. Oh, you can't, can you see the screen or are you? Are I you can see everything. No, I'm just, no, no, I'm fine. I'm just saying there's a lot of background noise. I'm perfect. My connection is fine this morning, Dr. Pass. Yes, it is. And I don't hear any <laughs> background noise at all. Only the sweet noise of your voice. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'm when asking, that... what's happening on this extra stimulus? Here's S1 and here's S2. So is anything different happening? I'll just show you, just to remind you. This is 600, 310. Keep that in your mind. And this is 600, 300. So we've dropped by 10 milliseconds. What do you think's happened here? Um, so after that, um, after that extra steam is put in, yes. there's like a... There's a block, there's no conduction. Mm, no, we're conducting, course. right? We're going from A to V here. Well, let me- uh, I let do me... know that there's like, it does look wider, much wider than the previous one. Okay, so um, uh, we'll go over there. But there's again. no so measure. That's true, I didn't measure it, so that's true. But this is 600, 310. And this is 600, 300. And uh, what I'm trying to point out is- There is no over, jump. Look over here, there is no jump, but, no. but look over here. The direction of the conduction in the V seems to have changed. Can you go back to the previous one one more time? Sorry. Yes, we have that technology. Here we are. Yes, so there's so, a change in so that the, V. The ventricular electrogram yeah. is different, right? It's, here it yeah. looks like every other one. But here it looks different. And the reason it looks different is because this is an A that is superimposed on the V. Now, if we look at the surface ECG, quite clearly there's a P wave and a QRS. So it is definitely conducting from A to V. But what's different is that if we look at the ventricular electrogram, there is another A superimposed on the V uh, in both the, heart, the coronary sinus pairs as well as in the um, the hiss. And so what this is an example of is some kind of an echo beat, meaning that there has been re-entry somewhere causing an atrial depolarization that is occurring simultaneous or very shortly thereafter the QRS is depolarizing. Um, but we call it an echo beat rather than a tachycardia beat because this extra A does not then conduct down to the ventricle. Okay, so it... Uh, so we're going A through the AV node to the His, through the His Purkinje system to the V, and then immediately after there is an A. So this could represent atrial reentry, or it could represent uh, AVNRT beat or an echo beat from AVNRT, because remember that in AVNRT there is reentry. Uh, in the AV node, and the, a, the VA interval or the RP interval is very short, typically less than 70 milliseconds. In fact, the A can even precede the V in AVNRT. So this is, um, so we see this reentry B, but then we don't see anything afterwards. So we would call it, when you have an extra A, but there is no V, we refer to that as an echo beat rather than a tachycardia beat per se. So interesting, let's see. So, so this is suggestive of the possibility of, uh, 
of the mechanism here for AVNRT. Okay. Here we are now at 600, 290, and we're no longer seeing that beat. Again, I'll remind you, that's what the V looks like here when there is no A superimposed on it. And this is the prior beat where there was an A superimposed. Now we're here at 600, 240. So let me ask Sergey. Sergey, what do you think happened here? Uh, so now Josie has gotten very tight with the extra stimulus. We're at 600, 240. And uh, what's happening? Here? What's happened now? Um, so now we see, uh, I guess, another. Hmm. Well, Looks like it's a QRS, another ventricular. Well, um, over here, we see a sinus beat, right? Because we're not paid. Yeah. Remember, you know what's going on by looking at the stim channel. So we have uh, 600, 240. So this is presumably coming in at 600. And then we put this extra stim in very early, only 240 milliseconds after the last QRS. And so what's happening here is we're not capturing. Oh, uh, right. Right? So we... We're pacing, you see this very large pacing mm -hmm. spike or artifact can be seen on all the leads here, but no QRS. Always look at the surface ECG to have an idea what's going on. There's no QRS here. So this is what we would refer to as the atrial effective refractory period because we're pacing the A, but we're not even capturing the A. We're so premature that the atrium is not able to conduct. Okay, so this would be re recorded as the atrial effective refractory period. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so we've now done uh, rapid atrial pacing and we've done, uh, we've assessed the intervals without any pacing and we've also done atrial extra stimulus testing. So now we're going to do ventricular extra stimulus testing. And in the interest of time, I'm going to accelerate it. But again, it's exactly the same thing where we're pace, pacing the V at a certain cycle length, again, in this case, cycle length 600. And we're putting in extra stimuli at uh, 10 millisecond decrements. So here we are at 600, 500. And so we're pacing the V. So the QRS is very abnormal in comparison to the sinus. So we're pacing the V and we're seeing retrograde A and we see that there's this little A in the Hiss and that the earliest retrograde A is in the Hiss. So that would suggest that there is at least of the catheters in the heart at this time, however the electrical impulse is going from V to A, it's most closely, it's most close to the Hiss. Now we are at, uh, I've, I've gone ahead a few minutes and we're at 600, 390. And I think you can see that the V to A interval, here's the V and here's the A, is longer, right? Again, I'll show you the, uh, the prior one. So here at 600, 500, they're almost on top of one another. Now we're at 600, 390, and uh, they've widened out. But again, we still see that the retrograde A in the Hiss is still earlier than everywhere else. And then we, so that was 600, 390. Now we're at 600, 380. And um, something happened here. So uh, let me ask, uh, let me ask Grace Kong what she thinks happened here. So again, here is a 390. And then this is 380. It's almost like there's also a jump in the VA conduction. That's right. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. It's not like that. It is oh. that. <laughs> so that is, in fact, a retrograde jump. And again, we say that we call it a jump in the interval when there is a greater than 50 millisecond increase or a 10 millisecond decrement in, the, in S2. And so this is an example of a retrograde dual AV node physiology. This is clearly a very substantial jump. So again, this was the VA interval at 390, and this is the VA interval at 380. And again, I'll mention that uh, retrograde jumps uh, or antegrade jumps do denote presence of dual AV node physiology, but again, that, as Uzo told us, that could be a normal finding. Okay, so here we are at 600, 370. Uh, wait, wrong direction, sorry. 
And then here we're at 600, uh, 360. So Cirque, what happened here? Here I see a similar, um, oh, so you're, there is a stimulus, but, but there's no response, basically. That's exactly right. So this is, what, what refractory period is this? You mean ventricular or yes. atrial? Ventricular. Yes. Yeah, that's the ventricular effective refractory period. So just like before, you identified for us the atrial effective refractory period. This is the ventricular effective refractory period. Okay, so uh, my next move in most of these procedures is to then do adenosine testing. Now, uh, before we go into this particular tracing, um, Neha, what should happen in a person who has an accessory pathway if we're V pacing and we're seeing VA conduction, what would adenosine do to that? So Denison would block the AV node, but um, likely not the accessory pathway. So you would still continue to have the A conduction retrograde that's, to the pathway. That's right. So a Denison blocks AV nodes, as you said, and not pathways. And so when we're looking here on this screen, we see a VA, VA, VA. We're pacing it around cycle length 600. And then we see a V and no A. So if you look on the surface ECG, we see all 100% capture of the ventricle. But here we're seeing VA, and then we see a V and no A, and we see a lot of disorganization or no relationship between the Vs and the As. Here's a random A, here's an A. So we're seeing VA block here, okay? So uh, this would suggest that probably there's not an accessory pathway. Now, there are always exceptions. There are uh, patients who have uh, pathways that are adenosine sensitive, but it is unusual. Now, here we are. We're back on testing again with uh, atrial uh, extra stimulus testing, and uh, we're on isopril because we haven't really been able to induce any tachycardia at all. And... Um, what, uh, what happened here with double atrial extra stimulus testing? Let me see uh, if uh, Uzo can uh, provide us with some insights here. Actually, wait, I see Perna there. I think we've bothered Uzo enough this morning. Good morning, Dr. Pass. Good morning, Perna, who did an outstanding job this weekend on service. <laughs> So we're pushing her to the limits by making her answer a question after all the phone calls and all the troubles this weekend. Um, let me look through it. So I'll tell you that those two red arrows are really the mm -hmm. questions. What is, what is happening on those two beats? Mm, I'm looking through it right now. So the ones before... Uh, so the two red arrows and the second red arrow, it seems like, so the one, first red arrow, it seems like the A and the V are superimposed, but in the second one, it's just V and, oh, sorry, it's just, yeah, it's just V, there is no A there. That's exactly correct. Very good. Um, so am I pacing on those beats? I don't see it on the stim channel. It doesn't That's correct. Stay. So those are spontaneous beats. And what those are, are tachycardia beats. Oh. Okay. Right? So we've done, so when we do double extra stimuli, it's just another mechanism of trying to induce tachycardia. And so here's the first stimulus. And then here's the second. So this A is conducting all the way to this V here. But then just like before, we see that what appears to be re-entry, and then it goes down the AV node, then we see re-entry, and then it goes down the AV node, but it doesn't re-enter again. And then the tachycardia breaks. That's a sinus beat here. So these are two tachycardia beats that have been induced from the extra stimulus. And when you see a VA interval that's so tight, it's highly suggestive of a, uh, of, again, of AVNRT. Now it's possible this could be atrial reentry, 
that just happens to fall always at the same time as the QRS. But it is curious that it is that we saw an echo or two before, and now we're seeing two tachycardia beats. So this is the, excuse me, the first tachycardia beats of this procedure. And then uh, we did it again, and we were able to now this time uh, actually get three tachycardia beats. Um, and you see what's happening is that it's going presumably, could be going down the slow pathway, A to B, but the uh, retrograde up the fast pathway, it's just not able or robust enough to maintain tachycardia, and so the tachycardia breaks. And it's breaking in the, if this is AVNRT, it's breaking in the fast pathway. Uh, and it's interesting, if you look at the, how the A and the V are superimposed on each other in this beat, and then in this beat, in this beat, you notice that the V and the A are a little bit less superimposed. It's almost as if the retrograde fast pathway is struggling to conduct retrograde. And so the RP interval or the VA interval is a little bit longer. And then finally, there's no VA conduction and it breaks. So what are the data that we have obtained so far? Uh, we have decremental concentric AV conduction. Concentric means that it's earliest near the AV node. We have, uh, but we don't have any uh, anti-grade dual AV node physiology with atrial extra stimulus testing. We might have dual AV node physiology if you use the diagnosis or the definition of sustained slow pathway conduction, which we saw with the rapid atrial pacing, although we didn't quite reach that, that criterion. Uh, we have decremental and concentric VA conduction, again, concentric, meaning that it's earliest in the HIS or the AV node. And we do have clear evidence for retrograde dual AV node physiology with ventricular extra stimulus testing. We got two to three beats of tachycardia induced with atrial extra stimulus on very high dose isoprel with a retrograde atrial electrogram that was earliest in the HIS and a VA interval that was about zero. And finally, we also had VA block with uh, IV adenosine. So all of this basically adds up to no evidence for an accessory pathway. And we haven't really been able to get long enough tachycardia to definitively know that this patient has um, AVNRT. But we have this tracing and we know that this patient has had SVT. And so uh, basically, we went to the literature and there's this one paper by Steve Fishberger a couple of years ago, it's actually almost 20 years ago, in which he had six patients who met exactly the same criteria. They had documented SVT, but they had no inducible tachycardia and no evidence for a pathway. And what he demonstrated in this small retrospective study is that when he did slow pathway modifications in these patients, assuming that they had AVNRT, uh, it was successful in the majority of cases. And so in this case, the presumptive diagnosis was AVNRT, but we don't really know with 100% certainty because we never truly induced sustained AVNRT. But as you see, we have a lot of evidence that is circ circumstantial evidence that this was in fact AVNRT by ruling out a lot of other factors uh, or other diagnoses. And so, we put our catheter up into the lowest third of Koch's triangle, and this is the type of signal that we typically wanna see for a slow pathway modification with a uh, small atrial electrogram and a larger ventricular electrogram. And uh, when we turned RF energy on, what you're seeing here is here we're conducting AV, but then the, uh, we're getting junctional rhythm here, a slow junctional rhythm. And that is generally a sign that you're in the right place in terms of a slow pathway modification. However, when a person is in junctional rhythm, you can't really tell what's going on antegrade with the AV node. And since we're ablating sort of close to the AV node, it is generally our practice to pace the atrium at the time that we're applying RF current near the AV node. And so what we typically do is we look for this very nice slowish junctional arrhythmia from the RF application. Once we see that we come off RF for a second, we start atrial pacing, and then we begin again 
to uh, uh, deliver RF current. And then in this manner, we can keep track of AV conduction while we are delivering RF current. Now, the disadvantage of this is we don't know if the junctional rhythm is persisting. But in my view, and in that of many electrophysiologists, the benefit of seeing and, con and confirming that AV conduction is normal at all times that you're delivering uh, a, uh, RF currents to the area of the node is important enough that it would, it's worth not knowing if you're still junctional. At the end of the procedure, we had, uh, you know, a slight, we started to wanky bucket about cycling 340, but we did not any longer have any evidence for slow pathway conduction. And we tried to induce on isoprel again. We were negative, and so we called it a day. <clears throat> now, we don't really know if uh, what we did is going to work, because we don't know definitively if the patient had AV and RT, although we have a lot of um, circumstantial evidence to that effect. And as you know, this is an anatomical-based ablation, so it's possible that if we, ha we had no marker for efficacy, meaning we were not able to induce tachycardia reliably before the ablation, and so we could not actually definitively know that we um, got it by not being able to show that we could induce it afterwards. But we were, on, were not able to induce after the ablation, and so that's all we could do. And so I explained to the family in this case that although it was likely it was successful, because we did not have a marker for efficacy, we will really not know until a few months pass and the patient doesn't have tachycardia if these efforts were in fact um, effective. So this is an example of how we sometimes have to make decisions in the cath lab with imprecise information. In this case, we have a lot of evidence that suggests that there's not an accessory pathway and we have a fair amount of evidence that probably the patient has AVNRT, but we don't have definitive evidence to that effect but we still went ahead because we had documented tachycardia. If this patient had not had documented tachycardia, I would not have felt comfortable putting RF in this particular patient. Um, does anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll call it a day. Thank you for joining, and um, we'll be, I'll meet you in conference in just a few minutes. So. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Bye-bye. See you, Keith, from Uganda.